we're going to be in chapter 1, and we'll start off uh, looking at verse 1. So, the book of 1 Peter is about the concept of suffering, and uh, looking at it from a biblical perspective of why does suffering happen, and, uh, you know, you think about the pertinence of that particular issue, we live in an era where that's one of the criticisms that people use to try and say there is no God, right? If there was a God, there wouldn't be suffering. So Peter's uh, answer to this is a treatise on that. Uh, so he begins uh, in uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and he says, To those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Uh, almost every letter in the New Testament begins with an introduction of this sort in some way, shape, or form. Typically involves the words grace and peace, uh, which uh, grace is the Greek greeting Peace is a Jewish greeting, and they kind of combine them together. Uh, but of course, whenever you're saying grace and peace uh, from God, it has a, a, a different level of weight to it. Letters in the first century are different than letters today. Um, today, you have to read the whole letter, and get down to the very end, and you go, oh, that's who wrote me the letter, because they'll put a little sincerely so-and-so at the end. Uh, a more efficient way to do it is the way they did it in the first century, which is they would tell you right up front. So you don't have to skip to the bottom of the letter to figure it out. So uh, here we're told right in the very beginning that it's from Peter. But then he also tells you who he's writing it to, which is those from Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That is known generally as the Asia Minor area. Uh, we talked about last week this group of people... Um, He's writing to are going to primarily be Gentile Christians, not Jewish ones, uh, written somewhere between 63 and 68 AD during a time when the church was beginning to face persecution, but it was not everywhere. It was more localized pockets of it, but you certainly would have heard about it. Uh, you would have been aware of the fact that there were Christians being put to death for their faith, other Christians being economically persecuted, all sorts of things like that. So he begins his letter by telling us here this group of people who've been scattered throughout these areas of Asia Minor, but he refers to them as aliens or sojourners. Anybody want to take a crack at what the word sojourner or alien means? Foreigner. Yeah, foreigner. It just simply means somebody who is not of that land and yet is dwelling in that land. So to be an alien means that they are living in Asia Minor, but they are not actual citizens of Asia Minor. Now, in a physical sense, that's not true, but in a spiritual sense, that very much is true. And you find that language used throughout the Bible of this idea of uh, God's people being uh, those who do not belong, we're strangers in a foreign land, we are uh, citizens of heaven residing here on earth. And, and so he starts off his letter by pointing that idea out. Now, there's a reason for that. Because it gives context to what he's going to talk about as we progress. Which is that simply we are... Uh, one of the reasons we suffer is this isn't home. This is not where we belong, right? You are... It, Anytime you are somewhere where you don't belong, eventually you're going to feel uncomfortable. Uh, even if you go on a vacation, there comes a day somewhere in that vacation where you miss your own bed. Right? You just think, man, I just really like to just sleep with my own bed, my own pillow. Um, and so that's context that he's using here. The other part is he refers to them as scattered. Uh, if you go look at some of the older translations, uh, they'll refer to that as the dispersion, and it is the same word. Um, dispersion is an interesting word to use. So you are foreigners, you are 
uh, sojourners, your aliens, and you're dispersed or scattered throughout Asia Minor. Uh, in the New Testament, we think about scattering. And when, when I say God does some scattering, what do you typically think of God scattering in the New Testament? See the gospel, right? So that's the, the standard picture that we have is the word is scattered out and it falls in, on different soil and in different lives and grows different ways. If you are a Jew, though, and you talk about the scattering, you're not thinking about the scattering of the gospel. You're thinking about the scattering of the Jewish people that happened uh, when they were conquered by Babylon and by Assyria before them, so that they became a, a, a people without a, a country, a people without a homeland. You go back to the Old Testament during the days of Daniel and before, uh, Assyria comes in, takes the ten tribes away and scatters them amongst Asia, uh, amongst Assyria. And then Babylon comes in, they conquer, they take over the land of uh, Israel and the last two tribes, and they scatter them throughout Babylon. And that became known as the dispersion. It's how the Jews became scattered throughout all of the foreign lands. And so uh, here, as Peter refers to Christians, he says, you are foreigners scattered throughout. You are dispersed throughout. Now, every Jew understood as they were scattered, what was the goal? Once you were dispersed because you'd been conquered by Babylon and Assyria, what did every Jew hope for from that day forward? Yeah, they want to go back to the land. Right? They wanted to go back to their homeland. They were waiting for the day where they could do that. Well, guess what? We are doing the exact same thing. Right now, we're the dispersion. Right now... We're scattered as foreigners in a foreign land. And so we don't fit in. We don't feel like we belong. We're uncomfortable here because here's not home. So even before he gets into the doctrinal bit about suffering, even in just the terminology he uses to refer to Christians, uh, he's, uh, he's already setting the stage for us to have a better understanding of why there's discomfort and suffering here. Uh, then in verse 2, uh, he points out three basic things. Uh, he says that you are chosen and you are sanctified uh, for the purpose of obedience and to be sprinkled with his blood. And mentions all three members of the Godhead in that. You're chosen by the Father through his foreknowledge. Uh, foreknowledge is simply the idea of uh, thinking about before. It's preparatory. All right, so God thought about this. This is not a mistake. Uh, the fact that you and I are here as God's people gathered together, uh, the elect, that's another word for chosen. <clears throat> uh, that is not a mistake by any means, shape, or form. That is God's design. It was his plan. What we're doing today is the Lord's people gathering together to worship him and study his word and, and, and to pray together and remember Jesus. This is not some accidental thing. It happened because of the foreknowledge of God and, and his desire for us to be that way. Uh, and then the next one is sanctification. You're sanctified. The word sanctified is, is really the same root as the word holy. It means to be set apart. Uh, it's often used with purification. You, you're, you are not going to be the, the same as everything else. Uh, most of us have certain things in our house that are sanctified. You may have certain dishes that you only use on special occasions, and those are sanctified dishes. That's, that's all that word means. Um, a, a holy cow would be a cow that is saved for a special, special moment, uh, whatever that might be. Uh, sanctification is the idea of setting apart. It, it's creating a, a specific class or group of people or things or whatever for the purpose of them being different than everything else. So here, we're sanctified by who? Who does the sanctification in this case? The Holy Spirit. So you have the Father's foreknowledge, the Holy Spirit's sanctification. Now you can look at some other verses, places like Romans 15, 16, Acts 11, 14, that talk a little bit more about how the Holy Spirit does that. Uh, the short version is, is primarily the, the message is, uh, of the gospel is the sanctifying means by which he does that. Um, but 
the Holy Spirit gave us the good news of the gospel. He gave us 1 Peter along with the rest of the New Testament so that we might be sanctified people. Uh, Peter and the other apostles make it clear that the things that they write were written not based off of their own desire to write it, but because the Holy Spirit guided their hands. And so we're sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We're set apart, and we should live like it. And then uh, uh, the, the next piece of it is that obedience and sprinkling with the blood of Christ. So God does, the Father does some planning, and then the Holy Spirit does some sanctifying, meaning setting apart, God, God makes this plan. The Holy Spirit says, okay, now let's get this special group of people. Let's get them all prepared and ready. And then the goal of it is that they would be obedient to Jesus. That, that's the goal. And obedient plus sprinkled with his blood. Now, that terminology of being sprinkled with his blood um, harkens back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you would sprinkle with blood something that you were going to purify or cleanse. You can, it, it really alludes to, you go back to Exodus 24, about verse 8, and you'll see where they would take the, the blood and they would um, purify or cleanse the priests for service with that blood. So the idea is, is that you and I, in the same way that the high priests would be cleansed for service, so do we would be. So the picture you get in just the first couple of verses is you don't belong in this world. You're waiting for the day where instead of being scattered, we'll be reunited together. But this is all part of God's preparatory plan and his foreknowledge. He understands this is the way it is right now. So live as somebody set apart so that you might obey Jesus and be cleansed for service. He said all of that is just like two verses. <laughs> it's really, really powerful. And that's just the greeting. That's just him saying hello to them. Uh, so does anybody have any, any questions or, or comments or anything like that uh, on just those first couple of verses before we get to uh, further in the text? Yes. It is. It is very reminiscent of the priesthood. And in fact, it's even Peter who will say that we are a royal priesthood. So yes, I think that that illusion is being made uh, purposefully. A absolutely. So, and, and what's the purpose of a, a priesthood? They are to be a cleansed people who are there to do service and offer sacrifice to God. So yeah, all, I think that connection is, is intended. I think you're right. Uh, any other comments or questions? Yes, Rafael. Yeah, you've got a great point that, that here would be a great set of verses to go to to prove that idea that the Holy Spirit's on the same level as the Father and the Son and has personhood. Yeah. relationally, right? So Christ, just like Christ says, I am in my Father and my Father is in me, that would be messy if it was physical. Um, but relationally, it makes a ton of sense. Yep, yep, absolutely, would agree. Um, okay, so then for there, we move into about verse uh, 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, that very idea of simply a living hope alone is um, it, it kind of harkens back to the Word of God because we're told the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a living Word, and it provides us with a living hope. 
right? So, um, and you also can compare that. I mean, what would I mean if I said my hope is dead? And what's the whole point of that statement? Yeah. Yeah, I have none, right. So if my hope is dead, there was a point in which I thought something might happen, but now those dreams have been shattered and it's not going to happen. That's a dead hope. Instead, we have a living hope and our living hope is alive because Jesus is alive, right? The living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15 that if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, what are we? Most, most pitiable people. Yeah, it, it, I heard it like in multi-surround sound. Yeah, <laughs> it's most pitiable people. We, we, you know, just eat and drink for tomorrow we die. What's the point? If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, you have no hope of being raised from the dead. The whole point of Christianity, the reason we follow Christ is that living hope. He's alive and he's with the Father, so we will be alive, and we will be with the Father. Our tombs will be empty someday, too. So, uh, and uh, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That statement of being born again hearkens to baptism, right? Romans chapter 6 talks about us being born again. When Jesus had his conversation with Nicodemus, you're being born of the water and the Spirit. So on and so forth. I'm, I'm not going to spend a ton of time there because I don't have a ton of time. Um... Uh, but then from there we move to verse 4. And he says, that living hope is that we would obtain an inheritance which is imperishable uh, and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So look at that, that statement of different things. One, it's imperishable. So well, I guess back up a little further. What's an inheritance in the first place? I know some of this stuff is, is kind of rudimentary, but... You tie it all together and it makes a beautiful picture. What is an inheritance? Yeah, something that's left for you. And typically it's a, a property that would be received or some sort of, you know, uh, wealth that, that heirs would receive. So uh, when you talk about being a Christian, inheritance is what heirs receive and Christians are heirs, right? And so what we're inheriting is not a physical property, but what did Jesus say that he was going to prepare? He says, I, if I leave, what do I go? Prepare a place. Yeah, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. So there's a place, but it's not here on earth. And, um, and he says, and here we're told that inheritance that we're going to receive, it's an imperishable one, uh, meaning it, that word imperishable means to not decay or become corrupt. It's, uh, it's a word you'd use for uh, spoilage, like uh, if you had fruit and it spoils, ever go to the grocery store, that's like our big complaint about Costco is that you, if we buy fruit at Costco, unless I eat it all in like an afternoon, I'll wake up the next morning and there's spoilage. There's, something's not quite survived. And, uh, and so it, it, there's a, a timeline on it. You can have it, but you can only have it for so long. Uh, here, imperishable is the opposite of that. There's no timeline on it. It will not spoil. So if you think about our time down here on earth and the, the larger picture of what Peter's talking about, that we as Christians are going to be down here and we're going to live as aliens and sojourners on a, and scattered throughout the world waiting for our homeland. Well, a lot of times the fear that we have with waiting is, well, as I wait in line, what if I get to the front and they're out? Right? I wait in line for the latest iPhone, and I get to the front, and they've all sold out. Yeah, Perry? And that's an excellent point. Yeah, because that, that does. That happens all the time, right? Somebody dies, and there was a will, but somebody doesn't like what's in the will, so they take it to court, and... Uh, things don't turn out the way expected. But you're right. This one can't be contested. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah.
Right. Yeah, and you're, you bring a good point. There is a big debate that people have over how much should I even leave behind for my kids. Just leave it all to Keith. Got it. Um, uh, you know, Proverbs talks about the idea of it's a blessing to leave something behind for your kids and your grandkids. But then when does it cease to be a blessing but a curse? We've all seen that where money given to people can cause problems. But here you have something that's not going to do that. And, uh, and, and you think about when we all go to meet God and we each have our inheritance. I'm not going to worry about what Keith has and Keith's not going to say, give it all to me. Like he's, he's going to have his and I'm going to have mine and we're all going to be happy. Right? So there, there's some really beautiful things in that too that just are, are fundamentally different. Um, undefiled has the idea of not being contaminated or impure. Uh, you, we talk today, we use terms like blood money, right? Um, they even used that with Judas, didn't they? Right? Blood money. The idea of something that's been gained, but it's ill-gotten gains. There's something not good about it. Uh, you can find that. If you start digging into your ancestry a little bit, you're probably going to find some unsavory characters. Turns out your family tree has some, some rotten roots in it most of the time. Um, and, and so there is that concern, I think, that we have with pretty much everything here on earth is that there's some stain or tarnish to pretty much everything, right? Everything that has a good side, there seems to be something negative hiding in a corner. And I know that sounds cynical, but it, it just seems to be the reality of truth, right? I mean, we just got done talking about money, which in general, people talk about as a good thing. If I asked you, would you rather have more money or less? Pretty much everybody says more, but we also know money comes with problems. Everything seems to come with, even if it has a front side of strength, it's got a back side of weakness, but not this. It's just wholly good, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's an excellent point. Here, every, all resources are finite, right? If I have more, somebody else somewhere has less. And um, I, I like to think of it like heaven is a little bit like knowledge. If I share my knowledge with you, I don't become dumber. You just become smarter. Right? If you read a good book, you learn from the person, you gain what they wrote down, but they didn't lose anything. But most things in life here are not that way. Most things, it's a finite resource, and if somebody's getting some, somebody else is not. And I think you're right. That's a huge element to this inheritance is my inheritance and your inheritance, there's, it's not, there's no battle over it. Right? There's no let me divide Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. There's no division in this inheritance. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, uh, then he says it will not fade away. Uh, that is, it's not consumable, which I think also gets to your point, is it's not only does my share not impact your share, but my usage of my share of the inheritance, my time in heaven does not deplete my time in heaven. It's not like, okay, well, Scott, you know, led a good life. You know, you, you did enough good works. So now you, you get 1,112.2 years in heaven. So every day I'm in heaven, I'm thinking about the end date. Man, this is great. I hope it doesn't go too fast. Right? Have you ever been on a vacation like that? Where it's like, it's just a great vacation, but you're, you kind of know in the back of your mind, you got to go back to work at some point. This isn't that way. It's not consumable. It doesn't fade away. Um, it's evergreen. Uh, and then the last bit to it is it's reserved. 
uh, meaning it's, it's guarded. Uh, th- there's an interesting thing about this word reserved. It's in the perfect tense. You do not need to know Greek to know your Bible. Let me know Greek and give you some color from time to time. If you want to learn Greek, that's great. But I just, I always feel like I need to put that caveat on there that you don't need to know Greek to appreciate the Word of God. But there are some cool color things in there. So here the word reserved is in the perfect tense. And that, that has the idea of it's already guarded or already reserved and will continue to be reserved. Right? Um, maybe you've gone to a restaurant sometime and showed up 20 minutes late. And they said, oh, well, we gave your table away. We thought you weren't coming. That won't happen here. There is no giving your spot away. It's already reserved for you, and it will continue to be so. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, as we, we think about it, it's reserved in heaven, meaning that is the location of which this inheritance exists. Um, so, anybody have any other thoughts on that before we move forward a little bit? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, as, as an inheritance, the people who inherit have some connection to the person they're getting it from. Yeah, yeah. And so you, it's huge. If we are not in Christ and connected to Christ, that, that's where the inheritance comes from. We're children of the king. So, um, Okay, so then you move down about verse 6. And he says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. Now, as we progress through this, uh, he's now going to begin to deal with that issue of suffering. And he starts out by saying, in this you greatly rejoice. So before we talk about suffering, we talk about joy. You as a Christian, your reaction to life down here on earth with its suffering is still going to be joy. Now, if you want the the great treatise in all the Bible on joy, don't go to 1 Peter, go to Philippians. Philippians is, that's the whole subject matter is joy. And what does it mean to be joyous as a Christian? Short version, it's not the same as being happy or having fun. They're, they're different. There are times where I'm not happy, but I still have joy. There's times where I'm not having fun, but I still have joy. And so here he says, you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Before we go any further, I just want you to see two things in verse 6. One, if necessary, means suffering for Christians here is necessary. But little while means it's also temporary. So he points out for us, one of the key things that gives us joy that we can count on as Christians is it's necessary, meaning it's not meaningless suffering. I hate meaningless suffering. You know, when something bad happens and there's just, you suffer for no good reason, that's, that's a really horrible feeling. It's something that's meaningless, has no purpose whatsoever. He says, that's not true for Christians. If you suffer as a Christian, it's necessary. It's necessary that we do this as a part of living for Christ and representing him and doing his work here on earth. But it's also for a little while, it's temporary. Yes. Maybe. Are you going to be nice? (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, you're absolutely right. And that was a perfectly appropriate comment, Pam. (laughs) Pam got me on Wednesday. She made a comment and then got me to say something stupid. Um, But no, it's true. And and even in uh, labor, right? You have that labor of the the pain of childbirth, but then there's rejoicing at the end. It is exactly the same idea. And that analogy is even used in the New Testament to refer to to suffering and and the way things are. So yeah, it's just, it's it's worth it, right? Um, And uh, so as we we move through and look at uh, Peter talking about this, he's going to lay out that joy that you have 
and there's a variety of uh, things that he will he'll point out. Um, you are going to have joy through manifold trials or various trials. Uh, as you look here, and, and I believe we're still in verse 6, where he says this, you're distressed by various trials or manifold trials. The idea is the trials come in all different shapes and sizes. It, the, it, the problem with suffering is that if it was only one type of suffering, you could probably train yourself to the point where it doesn't bother you as much. It's like, I've seen this before, I've handled this before, no big deal. But suffering and trials come in varying forms. Sometimes the trial is waiting. And you've got to be patient, and there's nothing you can do. Right? Sometimes you're the person waiting in the waiting room while it's your loved one in the, on the operating table. That's a trial. Sometimes you're the one on the operating table. That's also a trial. But they're definitely different. Sometimes your trials are physical ones where you have to go without. Now, Paul said that he learned in life, he'd learned to have much and he learned to have little and he learned to be content with both, which I might add means that going without can be a trial, but having too much can be a trial too. So there's all sorts of different ways the devil gets at us. And so we have to learn to rejoice through all sorts of varying things. Uh, joy through the unseen and unrevealed Jesus. Uh, if, if you look and you go down um, and uh, uh, you continue there, and when you get to about verse 6, um, uh, he talks, and I get down to verse 7, he'll say, it will result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, when Jesus is revealed. Right? Your suffering and your hardship and the trials and all the things that you face in life, it'll all be worth it, and, but it'll be worth it when Jesus is revealed. When he's revealed, it'll result in praise and honor and glory. But the trade-off to that is, right now, he's not revealed. Yeah. Right. And, and that's a huge point, right? The trials should point us towards Jesus, right? It, as a Christian, when you go through things and you suffer, it should point you to the day when you won't have that, right? So you have that hope, you have that living hope, so you can get through it because you understand this. I'm facing this now, but it, it's only for a little while. Someday I'll see him. And so you, you're right. That's a, that is a, a big point of it, too, is that as Christians, we're foreigners in a strange land, but we won't always be. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. The peace that surpasses all understanding, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we, we're to have joy, even though Jesus isn't revealed yet, but someday he will be. Joy through the refining process of this uh, in verse 7. The proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable even though tested by fire. That's a refining process. You refine uh, gold and other metals by putting them under heat and you remove all the dross and, and trouble. Correct. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And so that learning process of trials and obedience through trials, all of that, there's, there's a joy to be gained in it. Um, joy that cannot always be expressed. When you get down to verse 8, he'll talk about you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And that gets a little bit to what you were talking about with the rheumatoid arthritis, right? It's like it's an internal joy. I... 
if I tried to explain to somebody who's not a Christian why I have a peace that surpasses all understanding, that could be a very hard thing to do because they don't get it. They aren't, they're not building their life on the same foundation. So sometimes it's, it's a joy inexpressible. And sometimes, I don't, I don't know about you, but I can think of times where I prayed and I had such joy. I can also think of times where I prayed where I had such sorrow that I could not put it into words. And I just, God, understand what my heart is trying to say. Um, a joy that is glorious. Uh, there's a, a glory that is, um, we're told, it's a joy inexpressible and full of glory. Uh, things that are glorious are things that are bright and shining and brilliant. Um, Talk about a glorious sunrise, all of these sorts of things. So there's a, there's a joy that we are to have as Christians that should be brilliant. Um, that's, that's one that's uh, seen in us, that, that the world sees. Uh, and and the, the only way you get things to shine is with some polish. And that takes typically some elbow grease and some friction. And that's what happens to us as, as human beings. Um, and the, the joy that we gain is also, we're told, is an outcome of our faith. In verse 9, it says, Obtain is the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That also brings us joy. Right? So why can you rejoice through suffering? Because you know the outcome. You know how this thing ends. Right? You, you, you've not been through the whole battle. The details have yet to play out in your life. I don't know all the various things I'm going to face, all the different trials or suffering, but I know how the story ends. I've read the last chapter of the book. I cheated when read the last chapter and then I'm now living it. Uh, so all of those uh, come together. And then the other thing that we, we might want to remember as he hits verse 10 is the idea that this joy is a joy that the prophets looked forward to. Right? What we have right now, where yes, we do suffer for a little while. Yes, there is a necessary suffering for the cause of Christ. But we can rejoice because we're living in what the prophets wanted to see. In uh, verse 10, uh, he says, uh, As to salvation, the prophets who prophesied the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating, as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories of to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things, which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. It is impressive to think in terms of we as Christians are living the legacy of those who've gone before. Right? We just finished up Daniel on Wednesday nights. Daniel longed to see what we get to live. And there's a joy in that, of knowing all those who've gone before and the good and the opportunities that we enjoy because of them. Uh, now, from there, you get down to about verse 13, and now there's an action connected to it. So here you could say the first 12 verses, um, you have an introduction, and then you have you suffer for a little while, it's necessary, but you rejoice greatly. And here's a lot of different things you can rejoice over. Here's a lot of good reasons to rejoice. But then verse 13 says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Uh, keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So now there's the doing. This is a pattern you will see throughout the Bible. God lays out, this is the reason, this is the hope, this is the grace, and now you got to get to it. Uh, so, of the things that he lists here as we progress through the, the chapter, he tells you you need to prepare your mind. All of your actions start with the six inches between your ears. Every action you do, every choice you make, you are either prepared or you are not prepared. There's a reason we spend so much time studying the Word. Because it's preparation of the mind. You prepare the mind so you can go out and face. You look at police officers and soldiers and other first responders, and they train. And they train scenarios over and over and over and over and over again so that when they actually have to face that scenario, they don't do what the rest of us would do and 
totally freak out. <laughs> they are prepared. They've gone through the mental exercises. They say, I've seen this before, and now I can move forward. Uh, so we're told to prepare our minds. Um, we're told to be of sober spirit. Um, one of the reasons that we as Christians should be so inclined to sobriety in general is because we're to have sober spirits. We're to be people who are always at the ready mentally, right? A, a sober spirit is one that is not prone to extremes in the same way that when somebody drinks alcohol, they're more open to extreme decisions that they wouldn't normally make, right? They're more willing to say or do things that they would not do when they were sober. So too, we are to be people who are cautious of the extremes of things. We're in control. That's a great way to put it. We just watch ourselves, right? Um, and uh, uh, we keep our hope fixed. This morning, the sermon's going to be on heaven. Why talk about heaven? You're not there yet. I'm going to preach on heaven. Talk about five different names of heaven. Why talk about it? That's it. I want to go. That, and we've got to keep that hope fixed, right? You've got to keep that in front of you. Um, and so uh, from there, we're to be obedient to the truth. Uh, that verse 14 talks about as obedient children. That's the second time that word obedience shows up. It showed up earlier when he talks about obeying Christ in verse 3. Um, so that, this is part of our, our doing, is our obedience. Um, obedience is really only obedience when there comes a time where what you want to do is different than what Jesus wants you to do. It's not obedience until there's a conflict between his desire and your desire, right? When my kids do what I want them to do because they agree with it, that's not the real test of obedience. It's when I ask them to do something and they don't feel like doing it, that's, that's the real test. Um, and then... We're, uh, another interesting thing that we're really told to do is to rebel against the world. In verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. Conforming is what you do when you want to just get along, right? You, you try and match everybody else. We're told to be rebels. Not rebels against God, but rebels against the world. Right? That's our job is to look at the world's standards and its, its way of doing things and say, no, that's not my standard. That's not my way of doing things. If, if it doesn't conform with Christ, I'm not interested. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, if you're not being conformed to the world, then verse 15 says, but you're like the Holy One who called you. Right? So you're being conformed to Him. So it's, it's a matter of which pattern am I going to follow. There's lots of different patterns out there. And I know I'm going uh, pretty quickly here uh, through this last bit. Um, but uh, then the last things, he'll talk about a reverential fear and brotherly love, that these are two things that we should also have. We should revere God and have love for one another. Um, and so these are patterns of things that we as Christians should be pursuing in the way that we live since we have that kind of a hope. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Okay. Um, Mike, do you mind leading us a closing prayer? And then we'll uh, close out class here for this morning.